So I'm Ellen Crocker. I'm in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, and my area is forest health extension. So um, a lot of times when I'm thinking about invasives, I'm thinking about the invasives that are in our woodlands, um, the insects, the diseases, and invasive plants, all of which affect trees and um, the health of our woods. And today we're gonna to be talking specifically about invasive plants and looking at them from that angle of when they're in your garden or yard uh, connected to uh, the woodland context. So again, today we're gonna to talk about what are invasive plants and why should you care about them? What are some common invasive plants in our area? And then finally looking at what you can do about invasive plants in your garden and yard. And we're just gonna scratch the surface on all of these. So I don't expect to go into depth and some of you probably want this um, to be super, super focused, in which case ask me some questions about it afterwards um, and we can maybe discuss your particular issues. So back to my initial question, what are invasive plants? Uh, so that's, that's a good one. As we saw, there are lots of different definitions of invasive plants, but I'm going to give you the federal definition of an invasive species. And this is significant because it doesn't just apply in a particular context as much as certain species are designated as invasive. And why is that? So the federal definition of an invasive plant is something that is non-native to the ecosystem that you're talking about. So it's obviously native somewhere, but not here. And that introduction does or is likely to have major economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. And this all came from a kind of official meeting and this is somebody's definition, but I think it's important to keep in mind it's pretty subjective. So, you know, it all hinges on something that's not from here, but is likely to cause harm or does cause harm. And that, that can sometimes be in the eye of the beholder. And interestingly absent from this definition is what most of you brought up. So that biological perspective. So they tend to invade, they tend to spread rapidly and take over, um, which is key for a lot of you know, invasive plants. And those, that definition gets at something that I hear a lot, and so I kind of want to spend a little time on, uh, the, what is native and what is non-native. And really, this is a super complicated uh, subject because uh, you know, the timelines involved, uh, there's no strict uh, definition of, but native tends to refer to things that have developed over thousands of years in a particular region or ecosystem. So with the same group of plants and animals and insects and, um, you know, other organisms. And it should always kind of come with a geographic qualifier because is something native if it's from North America, but not this part of North America, you know, where do we draw those lines? Um, and it's fuzzy. Whereas something that's non-native, uh, it also might be referred to as alien, exotic, um, and introduced. So it's brought here uh, typically with human health that could either be intentionally or accidentally to a new place or a new type of habitat where it was not previously found. So the two pictures I've selected to show here are one of red cedar and one of honeybees. Um, so red cedar is native, but a lot of people tell me this is invasive and this is taking over my old field sites. And it certainly can. Uh, so just because it's native doesn't necessarily mean that it's growing where you want it to be growing. Um, it, you know, it's just kind of something about its history and where it was from. Similarly, honeybees are not native here, but we really value them. So we would not call them invasive, even though they can have negative impacts on native bee populations. Um, they do so many good things for us that no one's calling them uh, invasive. So those definitions can be a little tricky. And then, so just to recap, not invasive plants typically are non-native, they can take over and they're a big problem. So here's a couple invasive plants um, that I selected because they're both beautiful. They're both lovely. Uh, purple loosestrife and lesser celandine. Um, purple loosestrife, I used to work in areas that were just taken over with purple loosestrife. It's a real problem in wetland areas and really wet areas, but I've seen it in people's gardens as well. Um, and it will just take over an entire wetland. And when it blooms, it turns this gorgeous purple color and people love it. Um, but it's a dense 
monoculture of purple loosestrife and nothing else. And most of the year it does not look that pretty. Um, and similarly with lesser celandine, when it blooms, it's gorgeous and it's got these great yellow flowers. Um, but then the rest of the year, it goes dormant and you don't really see it and it does a lot of negative things. So just because something's pretty doesn't necessarily mean it's not invasive. And similarly, uh, just because something's non-native does not mean it's bad. So we talked about honeybees, but you know, pretty much all of our agricultural crops from apples to everything else. And then I got a picture of a ginkgo tree here, which is a great tree, especially for a lot of your tough um, sites, uh, non-native, but still really valuable species. So it doesn't mean that something's bad because it's non-native, but it also doesn't mean that something's good because it's a native. So we were just talking about this species earlier. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't see a lot of people using it for gardening intentionally, um, despite its beautiful fall color and the fact that it's a great wildlife species. This is poison ivy. Poison ivy is a native. Um, you know, it, it might seem to take over and it might uh, get in the way of some of the plants that you want to see, but it's really unlikely to have the negative impacts that some of our invasive species do. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that people like it and it doesn't mean you have to keep it. Um, so native does not necessarily equal desirable. There are plenty of desirable natives, but there are also some that we don't want. Similarly, native does not necessarily mean that it won't take over. So um, just like, not all invasives are going to take over in every context. There are certain uh, native species that can happily take over your entire yard. Um, so here's just a couple of examples. Uh, this is our native cane, as well as a sumac. Um, both of those native and great species for certain spots, um, but really bad ideas uh, for most landscape planting because they will just take over. Um, and grow clonally into big stands with nothing else. Uh, so I wanted to provide some clarification there on kind of what native and non-native um, and what they mean. So why are invasive plants a problem? Again, it's not always because they're ugly. This is a beautiful Chinese wisteria that, that can be gorgeous, but they can take over your yard and garden. And a lot of times I think there are some better species to pick. Um, both in terms of playing well with others and uh, kind of longevity and other factors, but also they move into natural areas. And that's kind of my particular focus where I'm looking at things from um, what starts out in your yard or garden can easily move out from there. In fact, it might not even be a problem in your area, but once birds eat those seeds and move them out, it can be a real challenge. So they can have all sorts of negative ecological and economic impacts. That was one of the, the key factors of what makes something invasive, right? Um, so here's a picture of vinca that I know people love as a ground covering, but it can just take over completely, whether it's in your garden or the woods. Um, so these might be direct or indirect. So they might you know, directly be taking the spot of some native plants or some you know, other plants that you want. It could be indirect, they could be changing the communities that are there, they could be changing the soil. They could um, change that environment so much that other species can't do well. They can decrease biodiversity. Now that could be the plants because they're growing in a dense stand of just that species. It could also be the wildlife, the um, insects that depend on that diversity that's there. And they can you know, fundamentally change some of these systems. Um, one of the examples that I think of is um, in areas where you've got a really dense covering of some invasive plants, you're not gonna get the regeneration, the seedlings that are growing up and becoming the dominant trees that you would otherwise because they can't make it through that dense layer. Um, so, and another thing that I think is important about all of these invasive species is that many of them might be taking advantage of changing conditions uh, as well as our changing climate conditions. Uh, so something to think about that these are gonna continue being a problem and uh, you know, into the future, something we're gonna have to deal with. So what are some characteristics of invasive species? So we talked about, you know, what's the definition, but what are some common characteristics of invasives? Well, they tend to have really high reproduction and you can see that here in this picture of autumn olive, which is an invasive shrub. Um, lots and lots of berries that can easily be spread. 
very fast dispersal. So in this case, if a bird eats them, moves them, it can and spread it rapidly, fast growing. Um, you know, you know the invasives are fast growing because you have seen it firsthand. Uh, they can tolerate a wide range of habitats or foods, depending. So uh, if it only liked one particular type of soil, it wouldn't become an invasive in the sense that we tend to think of, um, you know, taking over large areas and out-competing native plants. Um, a lot of them have few natural predators. So the idea is that Wherever they're from, they might have uh, insects that feed on them and herbivores and diseases. But when they left that location, they left those behind. And when they come here, they're able to thrive in a way that a lot of our native plants just can't because they're dealing with all these natural enemies and the invasives don't really have to do the same thing. Um, that doesn't mean that they're 100% free of insects or diseases or things eating them, but it does mean that relative to the native plants, they have this big boost. Um, and many of them can change their environment to their benefit. So that might be that they're allelopathic and they exude chemicals um, either through their roots or leaf litter that inhibit the growth of other plants. Um, there's lots of different ways that these invasive plants can discourage other plants from doing well around them. So just a few kind of common characteristics of invasive plants, why they're a problem. They come in, invasives in general come in all different shapes and sizes. So today we're talking specifically about invasive plants, but these pictures here I selected to show you, um, we have invasive insects like the emerald ash borer, we have invasive mussels, we have invasive fish like Asian carp. Um, right now we're battling an invasive um, a virus, this coronavirus pandemic. So invasives are all shapes and sizes, um, but a lot of those same kind of principles would apply. So let's talk about common Kentucky invasive plants. Um, unfortunately, you all are already all too familiar with some of these. And if I leave out your, your least favorite invasive plant, it is by no means uh, disregarding its importance. I tried to pick those that were really common across the state, as well as those that I felt like were up and coming. Um, but locally, you might have some really different issues or a particular plant that's really problematic. So we could spend all day, all week, all year talking about enlisting different invasive species. Um, so this is by no means a comprehensive list. But I did want to say that they come in all different kind of shapes and sizes. So uh, they're invasive trees. And why are they a problem? Well, in our natural settings, because they are taking the place of the native species that we want to see. A lot of times our invasive trees are doing really different things. They're not going to be supporting the same wildlife. They're not ever going to become the big tall canopy trees that you want to be seeing. These are going to kind of clog things up with a uh, species that, that will not get you the forest or woodland that you want down the road. Um, so some common ones would be things like tree of heaven. Now tree of heaven can tolerate just about any terrible, terrible urban site. So on that hand, uh, you know, it's, it's maybe some people would say it's a beneficial um, in that it can live places that most uh, species would really struggle in, but it will really rapidly take over um, other areas as well. Uh, princess tree or polonia, one that I'm seeing a lot more of uh, lately is mimosa, especially um, every summer when it blooms. And it looks so beautiful when it blooms, like a Dr. Seuss tree. Um, I get calls from people saying, what is this beautiful tree and how can I find it? Um, and I say, oh, I think you can find some better trees because this tree is going to be messy and it's going to fall apart on you. And it's going to look really nice for that one little window in the summer. And the rest of the year, you're going to wish you had something else. Um, and I think that's kind of an example of, of the, the life patterns of some of these invasive uh, trees. So one that I wanted to highlight, because it's increasingly a problem, and someone mentioned this earlier, is Calorie or Bradford pear. So introduced from Asia in the early 1900s as a rootstock for pears. Um, there are lots of ornamental varieties, um, but they have major issues. So they fall apart rapidly. They do not have good form, and we have an ice storm or a major storm, and they're going to lose branches and fall apart. Um, so there are better trees that you could pick from just a kind of landscape use perspective. But then they also will readily colonize old fields, roads, and one of the problems with that is it's not the species that you want to see in those areas, those long-lived species. Also, they have huge thorns on them, or they can, which can be a real pain for wandering around in. 
So here's some photos of an area near me in the spring. Um, they have these shiny green leaves that are alternate to each other. Smelly white flowers, if you've smelled them, you know what I mean. And uh, small fruits, they're not a normal pear size, but small fruits that are hard until they overwinter when they soften. And so these used to be uh, considered uh, sterile and clearly they're not. Um, so it, and there's a, there's a history there with that, that we could discuss, um, but they are a major issue in increasing. So one of the kind of most problematic groups of invasive plants in our state, I think, are shrubs. Uh, so they get in the understory of our woodlands and completely take over. We'll form these really dense layers that nothing's getting through. Um, and they might not affect the trees that are growing, um, the dominant trees as much, those big trees, although they do a little bit. But what they really change are everything about what's happening in that understory, um, whether it's the plants that are there, the uh, native wildflowers, the native shrubs, the tree seedlings that are coming up, um, the wildlife, uh, just everything is going to be impacted by that because they just grow really, really dense. Um, so what are a few of those? Well, we have lots, but I'm just going to run through a few. Japanese barberry, multiflora rose, autumn olive, and I see someone's mentioning in chat that they know someone who makes wine out of autumn olive and fruit leather. And if you Google autumn olive on YouTube, what you find are a lot of videos about how to propagate autumn olive and how to get it to grow um, because of the use of those berries. And I am 100% for using those berries of trees that are, that are there or those um, kind of small trees, large shrubs, um, but definitely would not uh, encourage anyone to propagate it because um, it will get out of control and uh, not be what you had in mind, uh, not the, the species you were looking for. Uh, there is no, uh, there's no need to propagate it um, or spread it further. There's already way too much of it. Um, so the one that is most commonly problematic here where I am in central Kentucky is bush honeysuckle. Um, and it's an interesting one because there are actually many different species of invasive non-native um, bush honeysuckles. Um, they have different names and they're sold differently in the ornamental uh, setting, but they can hybridize. Um, they're originally from Asia, but they're broadly planted and they can crowd out other species, uh, produce many seeds. Um, mostly what we have here is Lomisra macchiae or Amur honeysuckle, um, but just a heads up to you all that some of the things that are sold as different honeysuckles um, can also become invasive or hybridized with those that are here. And I'm seeing uh, somebody chatted that not long ago, uh, autumn olive was in the KDF wildlife package for tree planting. And that is, th that's true, at, and the same is true for a lot of the different uh, invasive shrubs that we could talk about. So, you know, they grow really well. They um, do some, they, they provide a soft mast. Um, they do some things that um, wildlife might like, uh, but unfortunately we learn from our lessons and uh, they, they grow way too well in some areas and will uh, prevent native plants from being able to um, thrive there as well. And um, it's by no means the only example of kind of a good idea gone wrong. Um, a lot of our invasive plants were like that. Where, and, and bush honeysuckle is very interesting because it's been around in the United States for a long, long time um, and really only started to pick up as an invasive in the relatively recent past. So there's thought to be this kind of lag period for a lot of invasives where it's really hard to assess whether or not they're going to be a problem initially, and it can take a while, uh, which makes it really hard to know uh, what to select and not to select. Um, so just a few more pictures of bush honeysuckle, um, lots of branches, one of the first things to leaf out in the spring and the last to lose its leaves in the fall. It's got opposite leaves, uh, which is kind of distinctive, these nice fragrant flowers, and then lots and lots of red berries um, that, that birds love to eat and move around. Uh, that can really spread it fast. Another one I wanted to mention, and I think this will be a little bit more surprising to people, is winged burning bush. So it's a deciduous shrub um, that's really popular in, ornamentally because it's got such beautiful fall color. I mean, look at these pictures and you can see it's for sale everywhere. But I've seen it in context where it does a lot of the same things that bush honeysuckle does. Um, not as much in Kentucky, but in some other areas. Um, so I think it's kind of, it should be on your radar too to avoid planting because it can do a lot of the same things uh, as a shrub. Again, beautiful, beautiful in that landscape setting and growing super dense in the understory as a shrub. So yours, it's flowers, nothing too distinctive, and those beautiful red berries um, in the fall that birds like. 
And then one other shrub that I think should be on everyone's radar is privet. So there are a couple different species of invasive non-native privet. Um, they are a huge problem further to the, our south, but increasingly I think becoming a problem here as well. And they're a very popular landscape plant. Um, you can uh, grow a hedge with them uh, that's evergreen. Uh, so I can see why people like it, but you can also see how it gets out of control. And if you have a hedge of privet, uh, you know that it can get out of control in your yard as well and sprout up everywhere uh, that you did not want them. Um, so just a few more photos of what that looks like. So they're also invasive vines. Um, whether we're talking about English ivy, someone mentioned that earlier, a uh, very common landscape plant. Uh, a new one that I'm seeing a lot of is Chinese yam uh, taking over uh, chocolate vine. Uh, another newer one that I'm seeing pop up more. Uh, winter creeper is one that I wanted to highlight because uh, I see a lot of it both in the landscape use as well as in natural settings. So it's popular because it's an evergreen uh, vine that carpets the forest floor. It can be grown as a shrub if it's growing kind of up something as well. Um, and it's, you know, all over the place. It's very interesting because it only flowers when it's growing upwards as a vine. But if you see these pictures right here, it's perfectly happy to grow as a carpet as well. It just won't ever flower like that. Um, it really is only gonna flower and produce seeds when it's growing upwards. And the, the leaves look a little bit different in each one of those um, stages. So it can be easy to confuse, um, but you can find it for sale in a lot of places, but it will just take over um, and form these really dense carpets. Um, whether that's in your yard, again, or in your woodland. Uh, so here's kind of a setting of a park in, in Lexington, Kentucky. You can see it's growing as a vine up those trees. Um, and it's not going to maybe directly hurt those trees, but it could overtop them and weigh them down. Um, it could uh, increase the risk of wind throw in the kind of major storm event, and certainly carpeting the ground and uh, preventing other plants from, from popping up there. And here's just a few more pictures of its flowers and its fruit. Um, so another one that we have everywhere in Kentucky is Japanese honeysuckle. And I see this a lot in the uh, landscape setting too because it grows really well. It's got these super fragrant flowers that to me are kind of the smell of my childhood growing up, you know, sucking the nectar out of them. Um, but unlike the other bush honeysuckle, the, the fruit of this one are black um, and it grows as a vine instead of a bush. So some more pictures, that's kind of what the fruit would look like. And like the other uh, bush honeysuckle, it does have opposite leaves and a hollow stem. And then another one I wanted to mention, because I've seen a lot more of it lately, is sweet autumn clematis, um, a popular uh, ornamental um, that will grow over other plants and structures. Um, you probably will recognize this one just because it is so popular in that context and it has these gorgeous showy white flowers, but it can completely take over whether we're talking about in the garden setting or the woodland. And I also want to mention that it's a tricky one because there is a native uh, clematis, um, but that uh, this one is not it. So this is the native here with the serrated leaves and this is the uh, invasive non-native version. That can really just take over. And then finally, there are lots of invasive grasses and herbaceous species. Um, bamboo. Um, my big advice is do not plant bamboo in uh, your landscape setting. I know a lot of people um, think that uh, because it grows really uh, fast, it could be a great um, eco-friendly uh, option, but um, maybe for kind of carbon reasons or something like that. Um, and I think our, our native trees do a great job of that already. And what you might not realize is that this bamboo will take over. And once it's there, it's really hard to get rid of. Um, creeping liriope, um, garlic mustard, Miscanthus or Chinese silver grass is one that I wanted to mention because I see that a lot. And this is another one where I think it gets planted for erosion control and other purposes. Um, it gets planted ornamentally in people's yard because it looks beautiful all year round. You know, it'll look like that in the summer and then in the winter you'll have these pretty seed heads, um, but it will rapidly colonize other areas. And despite the fact that most are sold as sterile, um, uh, that is not entirely true and um, enough so that it, you will see it along roadsides everywhere in much of the state.
Another herbaceous species that I really see increasing is lesser celandine or fig buttercup. You can see why people like it, and I've seen entire front yards uh, taken over with it um, because it's got these beautiful yellow uh, buttercup flowers that pop up in the early spring. Um, and here's an area that's been taken over with it. And once it gets like this, it's really, really hard to control because uh, what you don't see is below ground, it has tiny little bulbs that are, will easily dislodge, uh, makes it impossible to pull up, and um, it's a spring ephemeral. So it's there and it's gone. So your management window is extremely, extremely narrow. Um, so just a few more photos of what it looks like. Um, there are some other species that look kind of similar. Uh, this is a true uh, buttercup, so it's um, toxic to humans and livestock as well. And here's a photo of those little bulbs that just make it impossible to pull. So there are many, many more. We could talk invasive plants that are already here forever, and there's also a lot that are on the horizon that aren't here yet, but are likely to get here in the near future. Um, so whether we're talking um, sweet mock orange, European buckthorn, porcelain berry, or any one of the many other species that we haven't gotten today, uh, that's one of the challenges with invasive plants is that um, it's not even just what you currently have. It's like all the other things that we might not even know about. Um, so how do we deal with invasive plants in the yard and kind of garden setting? And what can you do to stop those invasives? So kind of my first um, recommendation would be preventing their arrival. And it's tricky. It's hard to know what's going to become invasive and what's not. And um, there, are, there are lots of non-native plants that are great, but I think one of the simplest things that you can do is plant more with natives and uh, plants that are known to be non-invasive, um, because then you just reduce the risk that those are gonna be problems. And it can sometimes be really hard to know, because I know when you go to uh, purchase some plants at a garden center, it might not be clearly labeled. You know, you might be buying them for beautiful color or the fact that they would grow really well in tough spots and might not be thinking about that. Um, so one resource I'd really recommend is the Kentucky Invasive Plant Council. They have a list of plants that they rank as severe threats or moderate threats or kind of plants to keep an eye on uh, that you can scan through that list and get an idea of things that you really want to avoid. And you can also find that group on Facebook and that's their um, website and the Facebook link there. And they also have a great publication that's Kentucky Native Alternatives to Invasive Plants. Uh, so it kind of goes through a lot of the invasive plants that we talked about today, plus many others. And what are some good native alternatives to those invasives? Um, and just to give you some examples, you know, here's a, a calorie pear in bloom um, on the, the left there, but then you've got beautiful other plants, um, native and non-native, um, that you could use as an alternative. So things like surface berry or dogwood um, that would really uh, do a lot of the same things, give you that beautiful fall color, um, but be less likely to take over and probably a better plant long term for your use as well. Uh, similarly, if we're talking um, burning bush, don't plant burning bush, instead plant aronia or Carolina buckthorn or some of these other natives that will give you that, that color element um, either in the leaves or in the berries. Um, and then instead of English ivy, uh, think about maybe wild ginger if you're looking for something to carpet the forest floor. Um, someone said uh, service berry is a great edible for the landscape. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, so wild ginger, uh, and here's the trumpet um, honeysuckle. And what I love about a lot of these uh, natives is in addition to the fact that they're unlikely to kind of completely take over your yard in the same way, unlikely to move into natural um, areas and take those over, is that you're also going to be attracting all sorts of great pollinators and supporting insects that you might not otherwise. Um, so it's kind of, you, you get multiple wins there, in my opinion. Um, so what else can you do to be stopping invasives? So in addition to preventing their arrival to begin with, removing those when you do have them. Um, and I put this chart up there because it's kind of a graph of how hard is it to uh, do manage invasives. So you can see this is area infested um, over time and control costs. And I think it kind of applies to like costs of time, of money, of energy. 
Um, so when someone's first introduced, it's easiest to stop it from getting there. If you can stop it from arriving, then you're good. Because the longer it's been there and the more established it is, the harder and harder it's going to be to uh, eradicate it or even manage it. So you can see, you know, maybe right after you detect it and it's just a few plants, you might be able to eradicate it. Um, but if it's already really established in your area, it's going to repeatedly colonize. So then what you're really thinking about is how do you manage it? You might not be able to get rid of all of it, but you can uh, locally eradicate it, you can manage it, and that's not unfortunately something that you can just do once and walk away from. It's going to be a continual effort over time, you know, scouting for uh, new arrivals once you remove it and also managing them. So containing and mitigating the problem. And one thing I'd really recommend to people is um, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. It's easy to feel like, wow, uh, there's so many problems, especially if you own a woodland or you've got a larger um, area that's just overrun, uh, to feel completely overwhelmed with kind of where do you start? And I recommend instead of trying to do everything all at once, um, pick a little area that you're going to focus on and really do that well and then expand out from there. So that way you're not exhausting yourself um, and you don't burn out with that and you can make a big impact in this little spot and then move out from there. So in your area, figure out which plants are a problem. So which plants are most common in your areas? Which ones do your neighbors have? And one thing that I would note is just because they're not invasive in your garden, doesn't mean they can't still be invasive in natural areas. I've heard that a lot about some of um, the plants that we talked about today. Um, you know, well, it's not a problem in my yard. Unfortunately, they don't stop there. They, they move out from that area. Um, and there's great expertise available to help you in local invasive plant councils and native plant societies, and most of all in your uh, county extension agents. So how do you remove invasive plants? Again, we could talk about this for a long time, but I can see we're already running out of time. So I just want to mention briefly uh, a couple different options. You, there's the mechanical removal option, so mowing, uh, mowing, pulling, grazing, that doesn't do anything typically for the roots unless you manage to pull out the entire root system. Um, and some species it works well with, some it does not. Uh, so you really want to know the context. Um, if you've got an annual species, for example, that's going to set seed each year and it's already set its seed, there's absolutely no benefit to that mechanical removal. Um, sometimes if you uh, take out the top part and leave the roots, um, you can actually make the problem way worse. Uh, so kind of knowing that. Herbicide. Um, so this is something that I think uh, the benefit of a systemic herbicide is that it will kill the roots and you can carefully apply it uh, in some contexts so that it won't necessarily impact the plants around it. A lot of times when these invasive plants are growing, you know, you might have a plant that you really want to keep right next to it. And so you can be very selective about what you're doing. Now, I also want to throw in the caveat that different plants might need different chemicals. So what works on one invasive plant might not be the same as another, and it's very context specific. Um, and then, Anytime you're thinking about herbicide, there's also a combination of mechanical removal and herbicide. So um, instead of just spraying the herbicide in the plant, you might do a cut stump approach, where if you've got a tree or a, a large shrub, you would actually cut the stump and then maybe paint the herbicide just on that stump. And that really lets you focus and get specific um, just on that plant, not impacting other things in the area as much. Um, some other ideas would be things like solarization, where you're covering an area with tarp uh, to kill everything that's in there. And it takes a while, you know, this might be anywhere from several months to several years um, to kill what's underneath there. Um, it can work, uh, but it's, it's a big undertaking. Um, burning, burning can help in some contexts, it can hurt in other contexts. So another thing to consider, as well as um, maybe locally some steam, like using a steam unit to kill something that way. And I see that there's some conversation going on in uh, the chat on vinegar that's going to be addressed next week. So um, there's lots of other options that are out there, but um, your results might be mixed or it might be uh, more challenging or case specific. And that's where you really want to be talking with someone who's done that and has some expertise they can share with you. 
So all of this depends on what plant you've got, what your kind of the species, the size, how big is this infestation, um, how big is the area affected, what are your resources and your preferences. So it's not a one size fits all kind of thing. Other things to keep in mind, don't remove when something's fruiting because otherwise you can spread the seed pretty easily. Uh, keep in mind plant life cycle and growth form. So I put that there because um, it's going to impact what, what strategies will work when. So one of the nice things about, let's say, bush honeysuckle is it leaves out before everything and it keeps its leaves longer than everything. So if you can time it so that you're uh, applying an herbicide when everything else has already lost its leaves, you're really likely to reduce your non-target um, impact on the plants that you wanna be keeping. Uh, so those are some things to keep in mind because you really wanna minimize the damage to your other plants. Those herbicides might be toxic to the plants you wanna keep and you don't want that. Similarly, the mechanical removal can compact soil um, any removal that you do, if you're pulling things out, those create disturbances that invasives can exploit. So you want to make sure you're doing kind of net positive, that you're not just kind of opening uh, the stage for a lot of other problems in the future. So long term, continuing monitoring, continuing your removal, and staying on top of things because you might have seed in the seed bank that could reestablish and it could come in from elsewhere and um, pop up for years to come. But new invasives will always arrive, um, whether it's new species like this Japanese chaff flower that's just been taking over along that Ohio River uh, corridor to something we don't even know about yet. Um, so there are lots of great resources out there for you. And I kind of put them together in one Dropbox folder. Um, so you can go to tinyurl.com backslash KY invasive plants. Um, and that you'll find a bunch of books from the USDA on um, identifying invasive plants, managing them, and how to tell them apart from native lookalikes. Um, so hopefully that'll be a, a useful resource for you. And if not, you can always Google um, invasive plant management and find some really good fact-based information that's based around research that's been done on what works for different invasive plants and maybe what's not a good idea. Um, and then I also want to briefly mention that there's some really great technology out there that I'm happy to talk more about if anyone's curious about um, to help you uh, identify and report invasive species. Um, so these are things like iNaturalist and EdMaps. And if you haven't used them before, I can't recommend them highly enough. Um, iNaturalist, if you want to check it out, it's an iPhone app that's free for uh, Android and or a, a smartphone app that's free for Android or iPhone. And the nice thing about it is that if you don't know, you're just learning invasive plants in your area, you can take a picture of something. So this is me out taking a picture of something and um, it'll give me a list of suggestions of what it thinks it is. It's not always right, but in this case, it's, it's pretty good. So it thinks number one, oh, it's an invasive. It's a winter creeper and it's right. Um, so in this case, you know, it's a great resource and a really good starting place, I think, if you're kind of just beginning and trying to figure out um, what plants do you have and are they a potential problem. And then EdMaps is a website where you can go and find information, distribution maps about all sorts of different invasive plants. So let's say you found something new in your area and you want to know where it is right now. So this is that lesser celandine or fig buttercup I mentioned earlier. Here's a map of where it is right now. And then here's a risk map of where it's likely to expand into. So you can see that's some really helpful information that they can provide. And you could look that up for any uh, species you want. So with that, I'm going to wrap up my presentation and open it up to any questions. But I also want to encourage you to reach out and let me know if you have any questions. Um, you can email me, but you can also find me on Facebook at KY Forest Health, uh, Instagram, and then you can find me in the uh, Forestry Extension Group at the University of Kentucky. Um, so